I guess we'll get started uh, because I want to acknowledge that all of you have arrived on time. 
Um, I apologize, I forgot, or all of us forgot that today was uh, the All-Star Game, which I'm sure some of you are <laughs> watching the All-Star Game, um, and we didn't think about that when we scheduled it. Um, but just so that you know, we are taping this session so that if any of your neighbors were not able to make it for whatever reason, um, the videotape will be made available so everyone can hear the presentations, everyone will be able to um, Everyone will be able to hear um, your questions uh, and our responses, and and so anybody who did miss it, they're not really going to miss it. They'll still have an opportunity to learn about what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Pat Martell. I'm the city manager of Daly City. Um, I've been the city manager here for 10 years, uh, and prior to that, I was the assistant city manager. So I've been here a total of 16 years in Daly City. So for 16 years. I have felt your pain. I know what you've been through because I have been here long enough, uh, dating back to the 90s, um, and know that we've had this problem, not with the kind of frequency that we have been experiencing in the last year to 18 months, or a little bit longer, um, but it's been an ongoing problem, and I, and I do understand it, and we're gonna talk about you know, what we've tried to do with it in, over the years, and now the kind of issues that we're confronting tonight or today rather, um, which are much worse than they were back in the 90s when I first came to Daly City. Um, to assist in the presentation, um, I have a couple of staff people here. The assistant city manager, uh, Julie Underwood, which many of you probably know her if you're on next door or you receive any kind of, of social media. Julie is my social media guru, and she takes care of all of our outreach uh, to the community. Also have John Fuller, who is our Director of Public Works, and his staff uh, in street lighting are directly responsible for a portion of the maintenance responsibility of street lights, and you're going to hear more about that uh, later on. Also want to acknowledge that in the audience today as an observer uh, is Council Member David Canepa. He's here to listen to the presentation and hear your comments. We also have a representative from PG&E. Mr. Scott Hart, who's in the back, uh, and he'll be able to respond to questions later on uh, that may be directly related to PG&E issues. Um, and then we also have another staff person from, from Public Works, uh, Sibeli Calles, uh, who is uh, helping out with the uh, DOT exercise. <laughs> um, so I um, want to first of all uh, talk about what we're going to do tonight and sort of let you know exactly what's going to happen and what our part will be and then what your part will be. So we're going to first of all start with just some broad public education about the street light system, uh, what kind of a system it is, how it got to be in the condition it is, what are some of the issues that we're facing in trying to maintain it, what are some of the issues related to the cost of, of making short-term repairs versus long-term repairs, um, some options that we have talked to the council about, um, and then we're going to open it up and we're going to allow opportunities for your questions to us. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to tell you what the next steps are going to be after we get input tonight. So um, one of the things that you should be aware of is that this problem is not going to be an easily solved problem, which is why we are here. When we presented a report to the council in March of this year about the same kinds of issues we're going to talk about with you tonight, um, we offered a series of, of options or recommendations pretty much consistent with what we're going to talk about tonight. The council directed me as city manager to set up this meeting to solicit your input about the various options that we're going to be talking about. So the council is very interested about what the public thinks about this issue. Now, we all know, trust me, what you think about the street lights being out. We know that loud and clear. Um, but in terms of how we can address th the issues, particularly because, as you'll see when we go on in, in our presentation tonight, while any kind of issue that affects you and your family directly is a very big issue. In the big scheme of things, the street lighting issue that we're facing, that we're going to talk about tonight, is only a portion of all of the street lights in all of Daly City. And remember, we are the largest city in the county. We have a population of over 105,000 people. So the 8,500 residents that are affected in 
your particular neighborhoods with these RO outages um, is only a piece of the big puzzle that we have to, to deal with in maintaining street lights throughout the entire city along with maintaining signals as well, because our staff who maintain the street lights, they maintain the, the signalized intersections all over the city as well. So it is a piece of a much larger issue. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about the issues and how we can solve or come up with some options long term to address this concern. Um, and it has to be part of a larger scheme because everything that we do in the city affects the entire city. When we talk about the issues that we're going to be addressing tonight and what the possible solutions are, it only affects a very, very small piece of the city. Um, and so just keep that in mind because as we talk about the options and some of the other considerations that we have made over the years as to why we couldn't just write a check to, to replace the street lights, hopefully you'll, you'll understand the context of why we have not been able to, to do that. So with that, um, we're going to start the presentation and um, I'm going to turn it over to Julie. Um, yeah, so if you could us, whoops, wrong way, inform us, um, you came tonight and that is great. If you could tell us how you learned about tonight's meeting, did you, if you could signify that by raising your hand, did you receive the postcard? Oh, good. Most everyone received the postcard. That's how you learned about it. Anyone learn about it? Sorry. Um, so it looks like the majority received the postcard. That's great. Um, website? Oh. Great. A few more website, about half a dozen there. How about anyone on Facebook? Not a Facebook crowd. Okay. <laughs> um, what about next door? Yeah, great, great. So about half a dozen on next door. How about talking to your neighbor? Did you hear about this talking to your neighbor? Anyone? Okay. About four or five of you? Great. Any other way? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. The council meeting. That's right. Um, it was mentioned at the council meeting. So thank you. And so, but it looks like most of you did receive the postcard and learned about it that way. Great. Thanks. So those questions are important because how we're doing outreach uh, is important to ensure that we get to everyone because a lot of times people get things in the mail and they just immediately throw it away um, and then say, well, we didn't know there was a meeting, but they didn't open the message. So that's why we're trying to gauge the um, participation in a variety of different kinds of, of public outreach uh, that we're trying to do today to broaden the number of people who will show up for meetings like this so that we can get broader input um, from the public. So in order to um, have you understand the, a little bit better, aside from the fact that your street is dark, um, but understand the technical issues related to the street light outages, I'm gonna ask John to um, walk through a couple of, of slides that's, that are kind of technical, but he's pretty good at breaking things down into just general English instead of engineering talk. So um, he's gonna walk you through uh, the system as it is right now. Yeah, in order, you know, when you want to complain about a pothole on the street or a traffic signal doesn't work, you talk to me. It says yeah. it's on. Uh, you call Public Works and we take care of it. Uh, when it comes to street lights, in your side of town, it's not that easy. And that's what I'm here to tell you about is why it's so difficult. Um, most of the street light outages that are, that are uh, in your neighborhoods are caused by power source failures. Basically, a PG&E provides electricity to our street lights, and it's the power source that goes out. The lights still work, there's just no electricity. Uh, the street light systems on your side of town are powered by what's called a regulated output transformer, also commonly known as an RO, and because I call them ROs all the time, I'll slip into that nomenclature. But they get that name because of what's known as a regulated output um, transformer, which is a different kind of transformer than almost any transformer you'll see on a pg and &E pole that powers your house. Uh, the problem is isolated basically to the western side of town because that's where all the RO uh, 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 circuits exist. And will my pointer work here? Yeah, it will. 
That's an RO regulated output transformer right there. It's about three times bigger than what you'd normally see in your neighborhood for a step down transformer that takes the PG&E primary voltage, which is usually in thousands of volts, down to hundreds of volts before it comes into your house. This thing kind of does the same thing, but, it, but basically it maintains a constant amperage by regulating the voltage, and that voltage is very high. It uses the primary voltage, the 5,000, 4,000 volt primary voltage that's in the very top lines on the PG&E pole. <laughs> the components that are maintained by PG&E to keep the power running are this big transformer, a little switch right there. It's not little, it's about a foot tall. It's called a Kyle switch. And then down on the pole at some location, in this particular pole, it's right there, there's a photo cell. The photo cell tells the Kyle switch when the sun goes down and tells the Kyle switch to turn on this transformer. What typically happens when lights go out in these systems, when in good times, when we're not having lots of problems, is this photo cell might fail and it won't tell the Kyle switch to turn on. PG&E will usually respond and replace those photo cells within a matter of a couple of days and the system goes back on. Sometimes these Kyle switches fail and they will not switch, even if the photocell is telling it to. So again, the transformer doesn't turn on, there's no electricity going to the lights. Again, that's not a big problem when these, when these uh, Kyle switches go out. It's usually fixed within three to five days. It might take a little longer if, it's not re if it goes out on a Thursday, it doesn't get reported until a Friday, PG may not fix it until the next Tuesday. Um, so typically, with short duration outages, it's those two components. If there's a problem with this transformer, it can cause problems with a Kyle switch, it can cause problems with the photocell. All three components can fail if there's a problem with this transformer. These systems are really old. The wires in the ground, these transformers, except Kyle switches or photocells that have been changed over the years, the basic components can be older than me. They were installed when I was first born, like in the 50s and 60s. I was born in 1952. Some of these transformers are probably that old. So you're talking about a transformer that's what, 75 years old, mm -hmm. 65 years old? Um, so right now, the pink areas you see on this map, including this, whoops, wrong way, including this one out here in Southern Hills, are all powered by regulated output streetlight circuits. The rest of the city is a conventional parallel wired streetlight where every light gets its electricity independently from the PG&E grid. So the only time that all the lights go out is if your houses and your businesses go out too. Otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's just a burned out bulb. And they're easily fixed. We respond to them within a day or two when they're reported to us. Um, we, when lights are out individually in the ROs, it's the same bit. We can respond to them within a day or two. When the power's off, it's out of our hands. In addition to PG&E losing power because their equipment fails, we, you, can always, you can also lose power in, the, in these areas because a car hits a pole and knocks it down. A tree comes down in a storm and knocks down a, one of the light poles and because they're all connected in one long circuit, they, a break in the circuit anywhere will shut off the whole circuit. Just like if you pulled the plug or the transformer went out. The, three, the four red areas, which you all live in, are the ones that are causing us the most problems right now. Uh, the, whoops, I pushed the wrong button again. The Skyline area here, RO460, has been a nightmare since about last December when that storm came through. It's never, it's been off and on, off and on. Off. And I think you've noticed that probably about the last two months, things have been normal, everything's back on. Um, and that may continue. Uh, so, f when we maintain these systems, PG&E maintains those three components. If any of those components go out and we lose power, the city, it's out of our hands. We can't do anything about it. We can't fix it. Public Works cannot get on that pole. We can't touch anything. It's PG&E's equipment. So we can't address that problem. All we can do is call PG&E and ask them to respond. What the city does maintain is we, we maintain, obviously, the light head itself, the pole, and the wire that runs all through all the streets connecting all the lights together. 
most of the problems that we've been experiencing recently have been caused because of PG&E equipment problems, photocells, Kyle switches, or transformers. So all we can do is get together with PG&E and say, here's the problem as we see it, please go respond. There's, there's nothing more our electrician can do at that point. Matter of fact, even if the system, let's say a pole gets knocked down, we can't touch the system until pg &E comes out and de-energizes it because there's so much voltage in these circuits. If you touch the wrong thing, you're not dead. You're, you're a potato chip. <laughs> um, you're, yeah. So even if a pole gets knocked down, the first thing we have to do is call pg &E to to open the, the circuit breakers and de-energize <clears throat> the system. Otherwise, we can't even... We can't even work on it. So even when it is our fault on our, our side because of a tree or something like that, we still need pg &E to come in and turn the electricity off in order to make it safe for our guy to work on it. Um, next. Oops, it's like too many. So these RO streetlight problems, as Pat has said, has existed for decades. The city did a study on it back in 1999. The consultant recommendation then was to do major repairs or convert the circuits to standard parallel circuits like exist on the other side of town. The cost back in 1999 ranged from 2.8 to 4.5 million dollars. With escalation over the last 16 years, that price tag is now six to ten million dollars, depending on how much of the equipment can be salvaged, how much of the conduit in the ground can be reused. Otherwise, if it's fully replaced everything, it's about ten million dollars to deal with all 15 circuits. At the end. Yes. And as Pat said, that they couldn't afford it back in 1999. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Pat, and she can tell you a little bit about her financial uh, so, situation. So obviously, one of the first things that um, I hear, um, and not just from, from you residents, which is understandable with what you've had to, to endure over time, uh, but the same questions have come from the council when we actually presented to them. and. Um, and their question, main question was, well, why can't we just replace all of those and fix it and be done with it? Well, um, it's, it's a question of cost. And so the next statement I always hear from property owners about things like this is, well, I pay my property taxes, and that should be enough money for you to be able to replace these right now. So in order to put it in context for you, um, I'm using this, and I use this whenever we do the budget presentation for the City Council, to remind the Council as well as the public about what your property tax dollars go for, and to put it in, co in the proper context. So for every one dollar that you pay in your property taxes, that does not go to the City of, of Daly City. Remember, you write your checks to the County of San Mateo. The County of San Mateo collects those tax dollars that are valued in our city, that are intended to pay for our services and our capital projects, um, but the county collects it. And the reason why is because it doesn't all go to Daly City. As you can see, about 45%, almost half, almost 50 cents of your every $1 goes to the schools. <coughs> That's right off the top. Then another 22% goes to the collector. San Mateo County. 17%, about 17 cents, comes back to Daly City. So I, I share this with you so that you understand that if Daly City were able to collect every single one of your tax dollars and be able to put it to good use here in our community, we wouldn't be having this conversation today because we would have taken care of this problem a long time ago. But because we don't collect the full $1 of every tax dollar that you spend, each one of those 17 cents on each dollar that we collect is actually going to pay for every single thing that we do in the city. It's not just repairing the street lights. It's the two most important services you get, police and fire. Public safety is the most expensive operation we have in this city. So that's right off the top. Then we provide for community benefits broadly. 
libraries, recreational facilities, our community centers, our recreational programs. Um, we also provide general fund dollars, general tax dollars for things in public works. And public works, as you're going to hear in a few minutes, has other tax sources that they also combine to, to do the things that we have to do in Daly City. But a large portion of our general fund dollars are also given to public works to maintain the parks. They do all the parks maintenance, landscape maintenance, all those kinds of things. They clean the streets, all the kinds of things that Public Works has to conduct, they also get general fund dollars. And then there are other things that the administration of the city, our finance department, our community development, uh, planning, building, um, our finance department that handles all of our business licenses and all of the expenses of the city, the management of the city, my office, the council, um, all of those general administrative costs of the city are all the things that that 17 cents goes towards. So it's not a question of us just having a huge pot of money just sitting there with all of your tax dollars. Um, it's all being spent regularly on all the services and operations that the city is conducting. Um, and so that's why, um, even back in 1999, and I was here when we did the consultant study, even at that time, the cost of replacing okay. the street lights in your area, even before we had these kinds of problems, was way beyond what the city could afford. Um, and so, based on the consultant's report, we continued on the way that we have, which is repair them as, you know, we have problems. Uh, and fortunately, for a good number of years, while we had problems periodically, we could get by with it because it wasn't always the constant kind of thing that we're experiencing now. So, Why can't we fund the ROs? Well, I gave you a little sense of it in terms of explaining to you what uh, the city's general fund um, dollars uh, are comprised of. But again, to put it into perspective for you, Daly City is the largest city in San Mateo County, largest population. If you take a look at this chart, and again, this is a chart that we use when we prepare the budget for the city council every two years to put it in perspective about why we can only do certain things and we can't do other things. Of the cities that we have listed here, you can see that Daly City is close to the bottom in terms of per capita revenue. That means the amount of revenue that we get based on our population to use in the general operations of the city. And so while, e while we are the largest and we have the largest amount of services that we have to deliver to this community, the cost per resident in the community that we recoup in terms of tax dollars is much lower than many of the other cities, Burlingame, Redwood City, Menlo Park, San Carlos, even our neighbors, San Mateo, um, San Bruno, and, and South San Francisco. Their per capita revenue is higher, and that's even with a smaller population. So their cities are generating larger tax dollars, property tax dollars and sales tax dollars, even based on smaller populations, because they're not spending as much in terms of services as we have to. So that's the dilemma that we face, is that trying to deliver all the services with much less per capita revenue to do that Again, this is the reason why we don't have a huge pot of money that we, when things come up like this, that we can just say, oh, well, we'll just pay for it. We'll just write a check. Um, the city of San Mateo is facing the same kinds of issues that we're facing. So they're in the process of replacing their streetlights. They're going to spend over $3 million to do that. But then again, you look at San Mateo and the difference between what we're collecting per capita and what they're collecting is pretty substantial. So they have greater reserves. They are able to um, proceed in a way to address this system, this, uh, system issue um, in a relatively shorter fashion because they've got the tax dollars available to do that. Um, also, Foster City, even though Foster City is a much smaller city um, and they have smaller per capita revenue than us, um, Foster City, we, we actually employ someone who was their city engineer. Uh, he's retired, but he's working here um, to assist our public works department right now. And he's indicated to us that 
Foster City has a number of assessment districts that were put into place when a lot of their housing subdivisions were built. That's paying for a lot of the things that we have to be paying for out of general tax dollars. And he told our public works director that's how Foster City can do it, even though they have much smaller per capita revenue than we do, because they've got those assessment districts in place. Um, and that happened when, when areas of their city um, were developed. Um, so why can't we move ahead? Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, the general revenue, our general tax, which is based on property tax and sales tax, um, that a portion of that fund, aside from the day-to-day -day operations of the city that we're paying for, police and fire, parks, recreation, libraries, all that, we do dedicate a portion of your general tax dollars to capital projects. Um, now, those capital projects are things that have broad community-wide benefits. So when we are um, doing either some street repairs where we put in general fund dollars, when we're repairing facilities, um, when we're refurbishing libraries, those kinds of things that are a community-wide benefit, general tax dollars are allocated um, for that purpose in those capital projects. But the city, while we do have substantial revenue, it's not all in the general tax revenue that you're paying for with your property taxes and sales tax. We're also right now getting Measure A money. You may recall a few years ago, the county of San Mateo had a measure on the ballot, Measure A, which was approved by the electorate throughout the county. We are receiving Measure A funds back, but those are restricted funds. So Measure A funds are used for essentially street resurfacing, transportation projects, that kind of thing. That's all we can use that for. We did get a special allocation of Measure A money one time to use to make some ADA improvements at the Ceremony Library because it's not ADA accessible. But beyond that, we can't use it for general purposes, uh, operations and services in Daly City. We get gas tax. So much of what John Fuller's Public Works Department provides for in terms of street maintenance, traffic signal uh, maintenance, median improvements in maintenance, that comes from the gas tax. So that tax that you pay every time you go to the, you know, go to a gas station and fill your tank, we do get a portion of that. All of that is used for public works purposes related to streets and roads, improvements, safety enhancements, and that kind of thing. Again, restricted dollars. We can't take that money and use it for any other purpose except those activities. And the list goes on and on. Um, measure M, uh, from your vehicle registration every year, we get a portion of that back. Restricted funds that we can only use for pavement maintenance. Comes from your car affects the streets, so the money we get back, it has to be used to maintain the streets. Our water fund, now you all know this, because when we do raise water rates, it is an enterprise fund. Means that the dollars we collect from water and sewer, we can only use for those operations. Cannot use it for anything else. So capital projects to improve the water system, the sewer system, our water um, treat, our uh, wastewater treatment plant over uh, by Westlake Park, all the improvements that we've done there to enhance our system, all of that relies on uh, our water fund, which is an enterprise and can only be used for that purpose, same way the sanitation district. Um, so each of these have very restricted uses. So while we have funds in all of these various places, I can't just go to those funds and say to the council, let's use that to put the street lights in because we have that money in that fund. Legally, we cannot do it. We are restricted to the general fund, and the general fund, by the time it gets to the kinds of activities that are here, it's the smallest allocation, because we've already paid for everything else that we do in the city, every other operation, every service, every employee in the city, all of that comes off the top of general fund dollars. So. This is the meat of the conversation for tonight, and that is, given what you've heard uh, about what the problem is, given what you've heard about the constraints in terms of general fund dollars that the city has available for this purpose, um, what are some of the options? And we want to talk about this, and we're going to go through um, 
the options. And I know you're going to have a favorite and you're going to have your least favorite immediately. But let's wait until we get through it all so you can hear the various options and what the upside and the downside are. And then we're going to open it up for questions. And then we can have the, you know, the back and forth conversation about the pros and cons and why can't we do this or how about this. But let's just wait a few minutes. Um, we're going to start um, with the status quo. Um, which you know what the status quo is, um, and that is not a very uh, good option. I'm sure that all of you would agree. Um, and even if you were all to sit here and tell me you think that's a good option, as city manager, I would have to say, well, frankly, I've had to um, witness the same kinds of things that you have confronted in your neighborhoods for 16 years, and I don't think that's a very good option. I think it it is acceptable as long as we can keep the system on, that if it's you know, only periodic that we have something happen. But when it gets to the point where it is in the four RO areas which you represent, it's not a really viable option anymore. It was, it worked for a while, it's not a viable option. Um, but I'm gonna have John just um, talk about what are the challenges in terms of trying to maintain the status quo, even as we decide how we're going to find a long-term solution? The, the two challenges are that this system is just getting really old. And we are highly dependent on PG&E to maintain their equipment to keep it running. We can't control that process. We can complain to PG&E, but, but in the final analysis, we can't touch those particular components. As the system continues to age, the pieces on our side may also become more problematic. We have had circuits like the one in the Palisades where wires actually burned up under the ground. And usually what happens is because the voltage is so high, once you get a break in a wire anywhere, that, that regulated output transformer is trying to put out electricity. And if a wire burns up and goes to ground, literally is in the ground, the electricity is basically being pumped into the ground, it'll overload that wire and there'll be like a cascade failure where it'll burn that wire at multiple locations all the way back to the transformer. It can take days and weeks to find those burned wires under the ground. And we had that problem about four years ago in the Palisades neighborhood and we were pulling new wire in all of our conduits and spending, because every time you find a, found a broken spot, We'd call PG&E and say, hey, we think we got it. Turn the power back on. It wouldn't work because there was still another break. So then we had to find the next break, fix that one, turn the power back on. And I think in that particular time, there was three different burnouts. And it took us about a week to find each one. Uh, in some cases, we were pulling wire, new wires on the ground for, for days on end until we got it all replaced in a couple of the, couple of the areas. Um, but the biggest problem, ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, is that PG&E's equipment that's exposed to the weather right out against the coast, because this latest round of rash of problems all happened after that big storm back in the middle of December. That's when it started happening. It was this RO, that RO, this RO, that RO. But they're all the ones right up against the coast. That they're just susceptible to more corrosion and wear and what have you, which makes them more prone to failure and it's, I don't think there's no, there's no mystery about why the ones closest to the coast are the ones that have the most problems. We've got ROs like the one over in Southern Hills. I don't think it's ever failed in the six years I've worked here. It's run fine. So it's the fact that the ones closest to the coast are aging and deteriorating, including PG&E's portion of it, more rapidly than, than anything else. So even when we get major repairs done and new transformers and stuff put on, it's probably not going to make the problem go away. It's just going to go away for a couple of years and then it's going to come back. And we'll go through this again. I've been here for six years and we've had basically two big spikes in RO problems. Once about four, four or five years ago and then the one we're going through right now. So if we keep doing what we're doing, you can expect that there's going to be a period of time like this again three or four years from now probably where we'll go through another rash of this failure, that failure, this failure, and just chasing it all over the place to try to get it fixed. Um, but then there'll be periods of calm in between. That's, that's our experience. That's what status quo is. Thank you, John. Um, so then we move on to 
the second option, which would be that the city finances the replacement. And I know that based on some of the feedback we've already gotten, um, emails that have been sent to me directly, as well as feedback that we've gotten from some of the uh, social media that, that Julie has sent out, um, this seems to be, at least among those responding, the preferred option. Um, and I can understand why. Um, because as I mentioned, uh, much of the feedback that we get in favor of the city just fixing it um, is based on what I ex expressed earlier, that people feel like I pay my taxes and it's up to you to fix it, Daly City. Um, the problem with that, as I've already explained, is that we don't have the funds available to replace the entire system all at one time. Um, it is estimated, estimated that it would be about $500,000, half a million dollars for each one of the four ROs. So we're talking about two to two and a half million dollars, um, which we don't have available for this purpose. Um, we could um, allocate general fund dollars, but it would be sort of, it would be on a pay-as-you-go kind of basis, which means that we would have to allocate, we would take away from John's department, from Public Works, you know, some amount of money, um, $100,000 a year maybe, uh, because we still have to maintain facilities in the city, so we couldn't take everything away from him and, to fund it. But for the sake of conversation, John and I talked uh, earlier about how much we felt reasonably we could allocate, maybe $100,000 a year. Well, it would take five years of saving up that amount of money just to be able to replace one RO. So you can see that if we're gonna replace all four, it's gonna take some period of time, 15, 20 years or longer for us to get all the resources together that we need and then proceed with one RO at a time because we can't fund them all at one time. Um, this. You know, we've been looking for other sources. We have looked at um, some financing uh, kinds of opportunities. Um, the costs associated with um, working with companies that will finance it for us, the interest payments on that kind of financing to be able to get the capital we need to do this is really a, just, it, it's exorbitant. We can't afford to do that. It costs us more. Um, than it would if we did it on a pay-as-you-go basis. So although we are looking to see if there are other government grants, because obviously um, the state is very interested in helping uh, lo local governments to become more energy efficient. I mean, we have a statewide initiative to try and improve our energy usage uh, in all government operations at all level. Um, so we have explored the possibility of getting those funds. The problem is, is that it won't pay for the entire replacement of the system. It would only provide a portion of the funding that we need. Um, and so we can do city financing of it, but it will take a much longer period of time for us to be able to do that. If in the end that's the only alternative we have, then we will put together a program um, and we will determine based on the areas uh, that are most affected, which area is the most heavily affected. In other words, which one has had the most audit outages most frequently for the most number of days over a period of time. And we would start there. And it may or may not end up being your particular neighborhood, but it would be one of the ones that is affected in this area of the city. Um, so that is clearly an option that we have, uh, but given the city's financial condition right now, I can tell you that it's not going to be more than about $100,000 a year if it's that that we would be able to allocate in order to generate the funding that we would need to proceed right away with, with this kind of an alternative. A third alternative uh, that we have looked at uh, as a possibility is an assessment district for this area. And an assessment district would um, allow for a permanent fix. It would allow for an immediate fix because once we establish an assessment district, we generate the <coughs> funds, we proceed along, and we estimate that it would be somewhere in the area of a year, 18, Probably two years uh, for us. It would take about a year to put the district in place and then probably by the end of the second year we would have the problem solved. Um, Obviously, um, I think many of you, while you may not 
you won't be in here in Daly City in an assessment district in your area because we don't have any assessment districts there. Um, it does require property owner support, which means that the property owners in the areas that are affected by an assessment district would have to vote, first of all, to put the assessment district in place. And then second of all, um, they would have to um, agree through their vote to help to fund uh, the assessment district in order for us to implement it uh, and to make the necessary repairs. Now, an assessment district, since I know that in your area there isn't, uh, there aren't any assessment districts. We do have assessment districts in Daly City. Um, we have some assessment districts for drainage uh, over in the Bayshore neighborhood. Um, do we have any others other than? I think those are the, the two. Um, and those particular assessment districts were put into place when the homes over there were built. And when people bought them, the assessment district was, was put into place to help pay for the drainage there. Um, other than that, we don't have any assessment districts. So the way that an assessment district works um, is that um, a plan is put together with whatever um, replacement plan for the streetlights. Um, we would identify the specific costs. We would allocate the specific costs across every single parcel in the district. So that means that the cost would be shared on an equal basis um, by, or, by or propor proportional basis, rather, because the larger your parcel, the more that you will have to pay. So commercial properties, for example, the shopping center, uh, out there would pay more than residential properties because it's a much larger set of parcels. Um, so, but proportionately, you would all pay at the same rate. Um, and with the assessment district, it would be for a very specified period of time. It would be only to fund the replacement of the street lights. So you would know exactly what it was gonna cost you each year. It would be put on your property tax bill and it would be for a specific period of time. At the end of that period of time, it would go away and you would no longer be paying for it. And it would only be for the capital cost. It would, in other words, it would only be for the replacement of the existing streetlights. The maintenance costs, everything else associated with the streetlights would remain with the city and that would not be a cost that would be absorbed by you in the assessment district. It would only be the actual capital replacement of the streetlights. Um, it does require, as I mentioned, voter approval by property owners. Now, one of the issues um, is that, that we realize is that there are a number of multifamily units and uh, rental properties uh, in your particular areas. Um, so the people who are living in those particular uh, residential properties are not the ones who would vote, and they're not the ones who would pay for it. It would be the landlords, the property owner of those multifamily units and or the, the residential, single family residential, if they're rented, who would vote and who would be responsible for payment of the um, assessment district. Um, so this basically um, explains again what I mentioned to you that uh, the property taxes would increase by a specified amount just for a period of time. All of that would be clearly delineated. Once the assessment district w sunsets, it goes away. There's no other costs associated with it. Uh, it's based on the property size. So the larger the parcel, like commercial properties, they would pay more. Um, how would we establish an assessment district? Well, first of all, we'd start with uh, an engineering study that would determine the cost of the replacement of the system then those costs would be spread across all of the properties, residential and commercial, in the entire area. Um, then, when we came up with that engineer's estimate of what the assessment district is, we would have a public hearing be before the council. Everybody would be invited to come to the public hearing. You'd see the engineer's report. They would outline the cost of the system, the number of parcels, and the amount each parcel would be responsible for and for what period of time in order to replace those streetlights. Um, then, uh, if the council agreed uh, to go forward with it, we would have a mail ballot that would be sent to every property owner. They would vote for or against. If 51% of the property owners in the 
affected district boundaries, that area that's determined to be the assist assessment district, if they vote to approve it, then we would proceed. If we get less than 51%, nothing happens. We just figure out another way to deal with this issue. So that is a third option. And we did discuss that with the city council. Uh, and they wanted me to bring that along with the other options uh, to the community that's affected by the, the RO uh, outages um, so that you would understand the different alternatives, the different timelines it would take us in order to do the long-term repairs. Um, and again, this is one option. Um, it's the fastest, uh, but we recognize that it may not be the most popular uh, of the options. So, um, Julie. Um, so, um, actually, I'm kind of curious, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you are a property owner, if you can signify by raising your hand. Okay, but it looks like the majority of you are property owners. Great. Um, so we have the people we need to talk to here tonight. Um, you can get more information about this subject at our website, uh, Daily City dot org um, backslash lights and I apologize that this address was incorrect on the postcard but hopefully you figured that out if you did visit the website um, we're posting information also on social media and of course you can also provide your comments or questions to dailycitylights at gmail dot com um, what about any renters here this evening any renters oh hey Yay, we have a runner. Great. Um, so uh, obviously, talk to your landlord. Um, seek their input on this important issue, since they're the um, actual decision maker on this. And they're on the um, website, uh, website information, same place. And tonight, we're also asking for your as Pat said, I mean, this is meant to really start to engage the public, but tonight we'd also like to ask you to complete a really short survey. It's a it's an 11 question survey. Katie's gonna help by um, handing it out. And um, we have hard copies. If you're wanting to be really green, you can go visit our uh, website and just plug that in electronically. Um, but we want your input that that's really important to us and as as Pat mentioned it is something the council has directed staff to go do and come out to the community and hear what you have to say if you could get us the um, survey either spend a few minutes to do it this evening or get it to us um, by July 31st that would be really helpful for us and then, of course, if you can connect to us, I'm just starting this e-newsletter. It's a brand new e-newsletter that will go up, go out monthly. So if you have email, um, you can connect to us, and you'll get the latest news about the city. Please subscribe, and that's uh, dailycity.org. Did you? Great. Um, awesome. That's great. And then uh, again, if you have questions, comments, please, uh, please reach out to us and let us know them. So um, one last comment I, I do want to make um, about the approach to um, addressing the long-term solution um, and the assessment district um, option. One of the things that was raised by one of our council members uh, when we presented uh, this information to the city council back in March was, well, why can't we just put into place a citywide assessment district um, and assess every parcel in the city to help pay for the cost of this? And there's a very specific reason, because um, when you establish an assessment district to take care of a particular issue, whether it's street lights or drainage or whatever, and the, the boundary of the district is established because that's where you're doing the improvements, those are the properties that are gaining the benefit of the assessment district. And so legally, we cannot either request or require that property, well, we could request, but we cannot require property owners who live outside of the district to fund a benefit that they are not receiving on an, on an equal basis. Um, and so council member who raised that issue said, well, 
you know, I bet a lot of people would be willing to help out if it was citywide because then the cost would go down. And it's possible that they might. And it is possible that that's an approach that we could take uh, in trying to address the system. But as John mentioned, uh, with most of the other areas of the city, the streetlights not having these kinds of problems, I suspect that it would be difficult to generate the community support to help fund the replacement of streetlights in just one particular area of the city. It's possible to try, um, and the council may tell us that that's what they want us to do. But, e but even if we do that, if we don't get the support, if we don't get 51% of all the voters in the city um, approving it, then we'd be back to the same situation where we wouldn't really be able to proceed on that basis. But I did want to clarify that because I know some people were wondering, well, why is it only in this area? It's because this area will get the benefit. Um, yes.